Okay, can you hear me? Great. Uh, so today uh, I'll be telling you something about virus and host coevolution, and mainly, or in other words, playing uh, sick and hide. So uh, this paper, uh, the, the, the talk will be uh, initially started a couple of years ago with our uh, initial publication on viral adaptation, uh, the concept of viral adaptation to host, and then it, uh, as, as mentioned, uh, was followed up by a recent uh, publication uh, in which we talk about uh, genetic exchange between uh, host and viruses. And that uh, uh, research was led by uh, Nadav Rappaport, who is in the audience, and I hope some of you had the chance of seeing the poster yesterday. So let's start by talking a little bit about uh, uh, viruses. Altogether, let's say we have about 20 million proteins archived in the Uniprot. Among them, about 1.3 are uh, originated from viruses. However, quite interestingly, when you compress this at the level of 50% sequence similarity, you can see that while most proteins are compressed by about factor of four, uh, the, the, uh, this is not the case for the viruses in which they compress much more, saying that they are extremely redundant. Another point to note about viruses is that they come, you know, like cereals, in many shapes, flavor, sizes, many different replication forms, and all this very, very big and messy world fortunately was organized a little bit by the effort of Viral Zone, which is supported by the uh, Swiss, uh, the Swiss knows what they are doing. So they organized everything in less than 400 reference genera, reference strands, and about 80 families or representative families. So at least we have a little bit of order there. So take home message number one is viruses are, surprisingly enough, the most abundant biological entity on this planet. However, they are extremely redundant and poorly annotated. So let's go and discuss a little bit about viral coevolution. What I mean by that? What we really want to do is to trace the evolutionary footprint of evolution, of viral evolution. However, we have a really inherent problem. Why is that? Because there is very fast evolution going on. As you can, as many of you are aware, there is a very high mutation rate, not in all viruses, but in a substantial fraction of viruses. And there is a strong selection, escape of the immune system, a lot of positive selection, so on and so forth. Even worse is the fact that there are no fossils, no phylogenetic tree, and no ribosomal RNA as a reference, you know, something that we are also used to build up phylogenetics using this. We don't have it. However, we have a little bit of a reminder from the Egyptian that viruses were there for a long time. Anyway, so uh, uh, to try and generalize some trend in this viral host adaptation, uh, Iris Bayer from our work uh, uh, divided the work to three pieces. The first one was really to get rid of the biases. As I mentioned, they are really redundant, and that fortunately was done by viral zone. The second aspect, which is a little bit tricky and I don't have time to go into, is really to define what, which virus infect what. So the virus host mapping, it's not a trivial uh, uh, task, and I'll skip this part, and I'll, I want to spend a few minutes about the adaptation signature that we developed. What does it mean by this? So we took the code and usage basically as a proxy for translation efficiency, and this is very classical almost. I would say that it is known that highly expressed genes correlate very well with their codon adaptation index. And the idea is just to have a score or a matrix asking how similar is the codon usage of one host to another or one virus to another, and of course, most importantly, the virus versus host. Okay, so that's the idea. So let me take you through this similarity uh, scheme. I'll do it very simply. Let's say this is a representative of a mammalian host. This is human, macaque, rat, so on and so forth, up to E. coli, so 30 of those organisms, and we ask what is the similarity score on this codon usage in which red is non-similar and blue is similar. 
and we, I don't have to talk much to show you that when you do this, you can see that indeed the mammals here in this box possess a highly, a highest codon usage similarity. As you can see in the same uh, graph, the bacteria, which is in the top uh, area here, uh, do have a very unique and crazy codon similarity score. What happens if we do the same, but now on the viruses? So the same 30 organism as before, but now I'm talking about their viruses. So virus versus virus codon uses similarity matrix. And here you see something very different. You see indeed the bacteria are very colorful, but here the viruses that infect mammals are highly variable in their coding usage. So the most in interesting is to try to see what happens if we take the viruses and compare them to their host. And this is here. So here is the same 30 organism that I mentioned before. And what you can see here are the host in the same order. So when you do this, you see this colored uh, matrix. In this, immediately you see that something stands out are those human and red. As a matter of fact, I'll take you through this uh, picture, but let me take off most of the information, leave only the diagonal. By leaving the diagonal, basically I'm asking what is the human, what is the virus of the human, how, how much it is related to the code and usage of the human, and so forth, and, and so uh, through all those 30 organisms. And the conclusion is that viruses of human and rats, quite surprisingly, and bacteria, as you can see here, are adapted very well. So what for? Why we need this adaptation at all? So really, uh, for answering why, we took 120 representative human infecting viruses, which, by the way, are more than one half a million, I, I mean, uh, yeah, 500,000 proteins, and we divided their protein to three groups according to this coloring. What I mean by that? One group will be everything in the viruses that related to the host recognition. I don't care how you call it. I don't care anything. Just those are the machinery to recognize the host. The second part in the purple are enzymes. In the sense, those are the machinery to replicate. Again, I don't care if it's RNA polymerase, DNA polymerase, just the enzyme themselves. The third part are those that are high copy numbers which account for hundreds of units within each virus, such as the capsid, the envelope, and so on. Unfortunately, we have another uh, group which is in gray, which is uncharacterized. I'll skip them, although they are the majority of them. So as I wanted to show you, not all proteins are equal, are born equal. And Let's say on the, uh, now I show you the matrix, at the distance being with the low adaptation is up, being highly adapted will be down, namely short distance, and use this color coded to show you that only the blue one, which means the capsid envelope type of elements that are expressed in extremely high amounts are really adapted. As a matter of fact, all the rest are not adapted at all, apparently to escape the adaptation uh, 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 scheme of their host. So to summarize this part, I should say that the maximal adaptation occurs with the highly expressed proteins, and our idea is that it's indeed important for translation efficiency. So let me summarize this short part. I showed you that viral I adapted to uh, I strong adapted to bacteria. By the way, that was known, nothing new here. Virus that adapted to host valid also to human and rat, that was new. Maximal adaptation is towards the highly expressed protein, that was surprising but interesting. And our interpretation is that translation efficiency is indeed a driving force uh, for the adaptation. So let's move to another strategy in which the virus and host are playing together. And this is what I call stealing. So I already show you that they know how to co-evolve for a certain reason. Let me show you how the viruses were tricking their, their host by stealing genes. So 
let's say this is our virus representative and this is a host, and we know very well this direction in which viruses insert their material into the host. As a matter of fact, the human genome is packed with 50% of our genome is all those transposomes and you know, uh, bits and pieces of history that were uh, uh, entered and remained there. But however, how much evidence we, do we have for this green arrow? And to distinguish between th these two apparently symmetrical view, which are not symmetrical, we set up some uh, kind of a, a parsimony thinking and the idea is that when viruses hijack sequences from the host, we expect to see many hosts that are, uh, uh, have this remainder uh, sequence. This is not the case when virus insert their uh, information into the host. And based on this very uh, little schematic, we were able to distinguish between the two arrows. So Nadav was raising three goals. The first one to show who are they? To identify those cases in which viruses hijack uh, uh, proteins, uh, sequences from the host. Second, can we say something general? Can we understand something that we didn't understand before by looking at them? And third, which functions are stolen? So let's start with the first one. If we go back to the tree of life, you can see that it's very, we can uh, 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 analyze all of it, however, we wanted to stay on the safe side, and by doing this, we eliminate all the discussion about bacterial world. The reason is that there is a lot of gene transfer and too messy to deal with. So we wanted to deal only on eukaryote and specifically on metazoa. So really, really the extreme cases. And fortunately enough, we could see that if you do a taxonomical view, the eukaryote viruses hijacked host protein in more than 100 organisms. So it's not a case of just human or just a specific organism, but among all those eukaryotes, we have more than 100 organisms that are involved in this stealing business. Okay, this is very classical. I'll show you two or three examples. This is a classical example of viral proto-oncogenes. You see here a pairwise alignment between a human and the, cyto and, and the leukemia virus. And while there are important differences between the two, this human, homo I mean, this human uh, uh, protein is very critical for cell cycle, apoptosis, cell differentiation, all the important stuff. And the virus, I don't have to convince you, that they are very similar. And a matter of fact, this example is just a prototype for virus causing cancers that are so important in cancer biology. So this is a very beautiful example, extremely well known. Let's go to a little bit over the edge to examples that are a little bit less uh, known. This is a clever mimicry of, as you can see here, uh, uh, of the viruses and the host, and this mimicry is on IL-10 IL like. IL-10 are interleukin 10. In this case, it's a CMV cyto cytomegalus, and the activity of IL-10, let's say in human, bovine, whatever, is really, really important. We know it. Because they induce B cell uh, proliferation, they induce differentiation. More importantly, they shut down all the MHC on the surface of the cells. So they are really clever entity. And the viruses hijack this protein. And as you can see, this is the bovine. This is the viral. And you can see both have signal peptide, do, both have the same cysteine bridge, both have the same glycosylation. I, I can show you the sequence and you won't ask. So in red are the viruses. In uh, those that are not boxed are human, bovine, macaque, and so on. And I don't have to convince you that, that they are same or very similar. Uh, uh, the signal peptide is very different, but that's not surprisingly. Also, between human and macaque, they are different. So this is the case in this case and other cases. So we have 180 candidates that are like that. 20% of them are good stories. The rest uh, I'll put aside for this discussion. So then, uh, in, con uh, uh, in continuation to the talk that we just heard, we went to see what's going on when we are talking about a remote homology. And for that, we took all the 16,000 PFAM family and asked when do we have a cross-taxa story. 
and we found 670 PFAM family out of about 16,000. And I just, I don't want to go into the detail, I just say be careful because there is a lot of contamination that comes, by the way, by us, us molecular biologists. For example, there are a lot of cell lines that were infected with GFP, CMV, adenovirus, and they were annotated wrongly as viral protein. Of course, this is a mistake of molecular biologists uh, 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 infecting all those cells, so we kind of avoided all the cell line originated uh, annotation, and there is a lot of cleaning up. After we do this cleaning, we end up with about 600 reliable PFAM cross taxa uh, uh, elements. So that's just a, a comment saying beware of the bad guys. So uh, the second uh, aspect that uh, uh, we wanted to understand is, OK, we have them. What can we learn that we didn't know we, before? What did this stealing and hijacking told us? And for understanding this, we took first the very uh, intuitive measure, which is what are the size of those proteins. And what you see here is an overlay of a viral protein in red and host uh, a protein within the same PFAM family that are in blue. And you can see immediately that those overlap very nicely, but they are not the same distribution. And you can see here it in a more quantitative way. So the eukaryotes are in average 500 amino acids, while the viral are less than 400 amino acids. So the viral protein are significantly shorter. And the p-value is, it disappeared, but it's uh, e to the minus 17. It just cut uh, a little bit. OK. So if they are short proteins, how come they became short? What makes them short? So I want to show you, this is, let's say, just for the illustration, three PFAM domains. OK? So uh, this is just like the color code. Let's call this a tail, because it's in the end, you know, the tail linker. And this will be idol, which is internal domain linker, in between two domains. And we wanted to ask how they, they, they become short. They could become short just because they lost their tail, like in A. In B, they lost some internal domain. In C, they lost much more. So there are many options to be shorter. So what is really the mechanism? Just uh, to, uh, as a small reminder, remember that virus in general are very short, despite the fact that there are some monstrous viruses with thousands of proteins. But so when we analyze this, we could, say, we could see that if the average length of the tail is protein amino acids in virus, in metazoa, it's 85. And the p-value is quite significant. The same is for the idol. So basically, in all aspects, we have an active trimming of the tail and removing of the linker. Do we see other phenomena, like the B phenomena, in which domain was disappearing, which will be a good, a good explanation for some active trimming of domain? Here is an example. Those in the, in the corner, I'm sorry that they, uh, it doesn't work. So uh, uh, in the middle, there is this virus. And on these three examples are hosts. You can see that each of the hosts have three of those domains, PFAM domain. And the virus really, the middle domain disappeared. Not only it's become shorter, it's also disappeared. So we have many beautiful examples in which active trimming and refinement occurs. So if I put everything in numbers, you can see that the length is shorter. This is the p-value. The number of domain is, is smaller. This is the p-value. Number of distinct domain is shorter. The average number of PFAM per protein is smaller. The multi-domain, if we force the protein to be long, at least three domains, what will happen in the virus? You see a very significant reduction. So the idea is that viruses really adopted simple domain composition. They don't want to mess up with a complicated domain composition. Uh, sorry. So let's go to the Trojan horse. The last few slides, I want to show you how can we really, really learn what are the, the, the functions that are stolen. I just told you about numbers. So uh, uh, Nadav was developed some kind of a, for each of these 
uh, uh, 300 or 400 uh, cases of metazoa, he made up a multiple sequence alignment, a distance tree, in which we are checking the neighbors to understand that we really are secure that this is a stealing event and not an insertion event. So altogether, we build up a catalog of 350 cases like this. Many of them are novel. So let me show you example. So in this table, you can see which function are affected. And you can see that most function will be really key processes in immunity, cell cycle, apoptosis, cytoskeleton elements, and so on. So you have mitogen, you have inhibitor of apoptosis, and so on. At the matter of fact, this list is just a sublist of these 350. You can see that you are talking about hundreds of species, as already mentioned, and quite a number of viruses. So the take home message is that the viruses use stolen sequences to overcome key regulatory cell junction. Can we summarize this? So we take all these 350 cases and artificially a little bit try to put them in order. What are they? What are they doing to our host? So this is one example. If this is the basal situation and you have a ligand such as the IL-10, IL-6 that I showed you in example, the viruses just compete with binding. So this real IL-10 cannot come in place. It's the viral that activates the story. Moreover, we have divided five different functions, such as competing on protein-protein interaction, competing on signaling pathway in a very, very clever phosphorylation-based story, on transcription, I mean, doing new transcription regulatory network by just throwing this guy and add another guy. And the last uh, uh, mod E will be on all the cell biology uh, uh, that we can think of, like cytoskeleton, movement, and very clever uh, uh, pieces. So I want to summarize what I just told you. I showed you that high vol evolution pace is a source of novel solution. Viral genetic exchange occurs in hundreds of instances, and not only in bacteria, that was kind of accepted. Viral mimicry occurs in most sensitive and effective control junction of a cell, or in other words, virus are really clever. And refinement to a simpler domain organization dominate these viral classes and all our ex uh, example. And more example you can read there. And this is Nadav, and thank you very much for your attention.